Hello, welcome to Scary Thoughts, Horror, Philosophy, Culture. This is episode 60. However, at the same time, welcome to Self-Help for Nihilists, episode 0001. That's how I'm going to serialize these. Cool. That'll give it a very industrial look later on when we start printing that shit out somewhere. Self-Help for Nihilists is a sort of sub-podcast to Scary Thoughts. Mm -hmm. For now, we're test driving it. Yep. And we'll talk more about what that means for us shortly. I'm Mark Kate. And I'm Chad Lott. Our next episode on Scary Thoughts is going to be about the movie Predator, which I think I was bullied into last episode. You can email us at whatthe at scarythoughts.org. And you can also email us for self-help for nihilists at nihilists at scarythoughts.org. Do you have anything to plug? Negative. I do. Oh, there. I'm performing this Saturday, September 14th, Saturday, September 14th at the San Francisco Electronic Music Festival. Really honored. It's something I've been following for a long time. It's kind of a big deal for me to be uh, performing in this festival. It's kind of, you know, the global and local who's who of experimental electronic music. How many people have magnets implanted in their fingers that perform at this thing or visit this thing? Only you next year. Hmm. Great idea. So it's going to be at the Brava Theater, except for Thursday, there's going to be a sort of 32 channel installation at Envelope. Anyway, if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area and this, and you're listening to this right away, come to the San Francisco Electronic Music Festival and hear me make some very loud noises. All right, sign up for our newsletter. People have been having issues with the sign up, and I did some research, and it seems that uh, MailChimp changed the plan, what their free plan constitutes. So mm. I've got to now cough up money. So I apologize to people who have gone to sign up for our newsletter and uh, rolled snake eyes. I will have that solved soon, and you can sign up for our newsletter at scarythoughts.org. Where do we want to start talking about? self-help for nihilists well it might be worth talking about like why we even had the idea for this podcast yeah i think i think we've rolled that out a little bit on previous episodes of scary thoughts but let's get into it yeah so other than horror movies and other miscellany i feel like one of the things that we both have in common is this kind of like low-grade constant pursuit of improvement but not not necessarily in the way that other people pursue it because we're not rich or famous either of us so we haven't pursued the normal shit very well right but you know like always looking for like a bit of inspiration or edge in our own pursuits and we i think consume a lot of that uh literature and a lot of those videos and a lot lot of stuff people do and i think there's an opportunity to discuss that kind of stuff critically in a way that we discuss horror movies yeah especially because we are living in kind of the nihilist epoch right now. And so the antidote to nihilism in some ways is like meaning. And there's meaning that you've received and then there's meaning that you invent for yourself. And the latter is what's more interesting to me and what I hope we'll kind of investigate on this show a little bit. Yeah, I mean, going through these horror movies and discussing philosophy, I think we often have come to, I, I think it's something you often bring to the table when discussing philosophy because so much of philosophy or at least continental philosophy mm-hmm. and a lot of post-structuralism, et cetera, your frequent complaint is, is this making your life better? Mm-hmm. Which a lot of, of course, late European philosophy refuses to even ask that question, finds a problematic in that very question. Mm -hmm. But I think it's still worth asking. Like, okay, you're reading philosophy. Are you made better at the end of reading something by Derrida in particular? Yeah. uh, Where that question is, I think, most problematized. Yeah, and especially you have so many people in... I, I guess like mainstream conversation now, like referencing things like postmodernism largely incorrectly yeah. when like they're making like these kind of gigantic straw men to constantly be battling against on YouTube. And you'll read people talk about philosophy or like postmodern philosophy like that. And you're like, whoa, you're not arguing at all what the people who wrote that shit are arguing. It's like, like often the conversations around Foucault, you would think that all he did was in state lesbian power haircut 
feminist teachers to ruin the lives of American males, like it, it, which is <laughs> not what fucking happened, you know? And then in kind of your more like capitalist circles, there's this huge interest in Stoic philosophy. And you're like, well, that was philosophy of a time and place that like, yeah, there's interesting things to kind of take from it and think about your life. But like the arguments advanced in that type of philosophy, like those arguments have moved on from that, you know, until you get to like Kant and Heidegger and then eventually Nietzsche, which he has his own version of like a philosophy of life, like kind of like things to live your life by. And then after him, it gets kind of weird and probably you're not exactly like going to put anything post Nietzsche on a, a, like an Instagram post with a kitten. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But it's definitely something you would weave into black metal lyrics. Totally. Yeah. I mean, Nietzsche is, I think, in a sense, a patron saint of what we're going for Mm -hmm. because it's, he definitely rides this very sharp edge between total nihilism and total Mm self-creation. And nihilism, at least of the Schopenhauer or Eugene Thacker brand, is very despairing. It's very pessimistic. It's very dark and brooding, whereas uh, Nietzschean nihilism is very fiery. Mm -hmm. It's very uh, luminescent somehow. I think that's something that's really interesting about him is this way of approaching meaninglessness and uh, arriving at uh, self-creation, which, again, I I feel like that's very much a place that we are culturally because, Mm -hmm. you know, I really feel like we're in this horribly nihilist moment in so many aspects of uh, American and global culture. But at the same time, there is a lot of self-creation going on on a very large scale in the absence of meaning. Mm -hmm. I guess we can also talk about how, you know, if we're going to talk about nihilism in particular, well, I think there's two things happening with Mm -hmm. this podcast, right? Is it's like, on one hand, we're here to discuss nihilism. But on the other hand, it's actually just sort of a a partially ironic filter through which we can discuss a lot of other things. Yeah. And the thing, I mean, the thing with nihilism too is like there's the the philosophical nihilism and there's like what you mean about it in like kind of a pop way. Like for instance, the nihilist and the big Lebowski, it's just shorthand for ridiculously selfish Germanic techno musicians. And it's hilarious. And you kind of know what it means. Like I think anybody, if you're like, oh, nihilism, you know what it means. It just means, people would think it just means like bleakness when it, like the more proper definition would be something like the despair felt by an absence of meaning in anything. And by anything, I mean anything. Like there's no, like you can never really know where you stand. There are no axioms. No axioms are true. And Eugene Thacker gets into this uh, territory of like the world without us and where there's the world with us where we observe things and because we're monkeys that make meaning, we're always going to be assigning like meaning to things. But there's an actual world, like the world of grizzly bears killing deer in the woods without humans around that exists without us that has no no meaning of any sort. It's just this raw chaos of nature. And then you get out into space and there's just raw chaos of space. And there's more of that than there is Christian rock. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. I think also there's the nihilist canon in Western Mm -hmm. philosophy, which is like Schopenhauer and Chiron and Camus and Ligotti, etc. But I think that what you and I might be more interested in is like The Secret and Deepak Chopra and Eat, Pray, Love and Jiu Jitsu. Well, well for, certainly for making fun of many of those things. Sure, but I, I um, feel like it all, you know, it, it, these are all things like I can just imagine the way that these topics f- have come up on Scary Thoughts, mm-hmm. our horror podcast. I can imagine just projecting forward and thinking these are the topics we're going to be covering. You know, like we keep talking about capitalism and Operation Werewolf and Judith Butler and yoga and, you know, and these are all various forms of uh, self-improvement, cultural Mm -hmm. interfacing, a way of resisting or plunging into nihilism Mm -hmm. in a certain way. At least that's the way I tend to think about these things. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, they're just like ways of going through the world. You know, like in Jim Jarmusch's movie Ghost Dog, he has a code and the code is the method by which he like interacts with the world. It's like his own little rule set. It's like if you had a Monopoly board and nobody told you what to do with it, you would despair 
at what to do with the colored paper and weird little figurines. But with the rule set in place, you have something to do that could be sort of enjoyable. And I think a lot of what people are doing right now is dealing with the fact that the old rule sets have been sort of torn up. And you can either adopt them, just go back. That's like the conservative approach is be like, let's back up here. We're just going to go do that thing that we've always done. Or you can get into a period a uh, position where you're like, I'm just going to make up my own rule set. And then at that point, you're like, well, what if you want someone else to play your game? You have to either convince them to or change it. And I think the constant changing and convincing is maybe at the root of what is causing a lot of people anxiety and stress right now. Right. Although I tend to view both of those as fictional formats, is that creating something new is very overtly a fiction, but so is nostalgia, so is conservatism. It's it's another it's another story we tell ourselves and it it relies on a conceptualization of the way things already are and have always been, but it never is. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's always a, a revisionism. It's always actually in some ways as much a construction ex nihilo as a sort of I'm going to take things from here, some, mm-hmm. some sort of overt, non-conservative approach to, to creating meaning. Yeah, I mean, I think like you saw a, a really in American culture, like a big burst of that, like probably the last, not the last, but like a really major cultural burst of making new stuff was like the hippies, mm-hmm. you know, like post LSD, pre-80s. Like the 80s is kind of like a return back to like the 40s right. in some ways. And like, so the 60s, especially, you know, the whole age of Aquarius nonsense, like that broke the old guard. But it's so weird that that came like so after like formal nihilism was introduced. You know, it's like you're you're looking for this new thing to be attached to. It's like the, the 60s seemed to be all about, okay, we the thing that we trust or we're told to trust, we don't trust anymore. So instead of giving up on trusting on anything, we're going to try out all these different new modes of being and people are going to try them out, out like all at once. And at the end of it, you just end up with like, eh, none of that shit really worked. It's like the Hunter S. Thompson thing where you see the wave of the 60s like crashed. Yeah. Like, and you could see the watermark. Like, that's to me, like when Nietzsche talks about the death of God, that's really the death of God. Like, it's the death of all the gods. Like, you've like, not even Buddhism works after the 60s, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so you're left either a junkie because the repercussions of so much experimentation have taken their toll, or you end up uh, a baby boomer capitalist who just, you know, snapshot, uh, neck snap, what's the word I'm looking for? Whiplash. Whiplash. To uh, almost the other extreme, which is just, you know, me generation hedonism. Yeah, and you know, the other thing too to think about is that nihilism and self-help are sort of like opposite poles, right? Like nihilism is... There is no meaning. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have given up on your normal modes of action. You know, there's something that keeps you alive. There's something that makes you want to wake up and brush your teeth or not. Or, but the self-help thing is like that there is an, an opportunity or possibility of becoming some better version of yourself. But like in the context of nihilism, like what is better? You know, what are, what are those metrics that you have? But I think the fact that most people can kind of understand what becoming better means at least in our, the context of this culture, means that there's something of a direction that you could go in. And I, I think that that promise of a direction is what makes it so appealing, that marketing. Agreed. Maybe since this is, in a sense, a first episode, we should talk about who we are and how we're coming to this as best we can describe ourselves mm-hmm. philosophically and religiously. You first. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> like, how are you? How do you think of yourself as coming to this kind of material? Like, what are your biases? Like, I'm just a middle aged dude that used to be pretty cool, you know. <laughs> now, like, the the midlife crisis has sort of arrived at on schedule in the most cliche and disappointing manner possible. And you know, I kind of like it was very fortunate enough through a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot of hard work, but also like a lot of good fortune to have sort of achieved what I wanted to achieve. Like I have a nice marriage, a good career, all those things. Yet here I am at like 41, totally dissatisfied on mo- on many fronts. 
and you're like, okay, now what? And I don't have, you know, most people it's like, you just pump out a kid and there you go. That's what, uh, but like, if you don't like myself have, or yourself have kids, you're sort of like forced to look inward and the broader culture doesn't really offer a whole lot. that's like terribly appealing to me at the moment. So I feel like where I'm at now is that I need to create some sort of meaning in this existence in order to like just enjoy it really, you know, or I could just lay around and watch Netflix all day. Like that's kind of the, like to me, like Netflix is nihilistic in a way, just like relaxing and just into passive entertainment. Absolutely. Do you think of yourself as an atheist or? No, not really. I mean, I just have too much uh, residual superstition to ever really like make a hard, hard like call on that. Yeah. I feel maybe similar, but for a different reason. Mm-hmm. I don't think of myself as an atheist, but I definitely don't have any experience that would make me think. It's like, I don't feel like, well, I, actually this applies to nihilism. I don't feel like a nihilist, but I certainly think like one. Like any any sort of philosophical position I can take probably somehow is going to wind its way back to nihilism. But I don't feel like things are meaningless. I actually feel like things are overflowing with meaning, that it's all already there. It's just I'm totally failing to just reckon with it. Well, I almost feel like there's like just everybody's generating their own meaning. So to me, it's almost like walking into a room where everybody's playing their own instrument and it's making this cacophonous noise. Yeah. And, you know, there's no escaping that. So you may as well join in on that crazy, loud, awful, everybody solo experience, you know? Yeah. Or be bored and have nothing to do. Like you may, or take yourself out, you know, like the myth of Sisyphus thing. Like, oh, if, you know, if there's only really one question to answer is should you commit suicide or not? I don't want to do that. I'd like to see um, the, at the very least the Breaking Bad movie when it comes out. You know, there's at least that to look forward to, you know? So like would, I mean, that's not exactly the will to live, <laughs> but, you know, it's the will to do something. Yeah. I think there's also something interesting for me in all the time I've spent sort of reading nihilist literature and philosophy Mm. is that it seems to be almost exclusively the domain of white Euro straight men for oh, the most part. I mean, this which, is, yeah, this is what Tolstoy's criticism of the whole thing was that like, you have to be so fucking well off and privileged basically to even entertain these fucking thoughts that it's the territory of the bored and rich and idle basically, you know, where you're coming up with intellectual games to attain the same level of despair as someone who is subjugated into slavery or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you're you're fortunate enough to have uh, the time or inclination to to be able to be miserable in this particular way when there most people are just miserable in all the normal ways right. and yet still have a little bit of joie de vivre. You know, that was like <laughs> that was kind of Tolstoy's whole reason why he became basically a peasant Russian Christian type of dude. He was like, he looked around and he was like, man, I have fucking everything. I got bitches galore, like 10 kids, all the money I could want, the respect of the church and the state. Like he was the man and he was super, super unhappy. And then he would walk around his like lands and stuff and see these peasants just fucking around and having a good old time. And he's like, man, what is it about these simple people that they have meaning, but they have nothing and he ended up in a weird spot, which was like sort of like Nietzsche says, so you're at this one point where like you either got to go backwards or you got to go forwards into something new. And he was like, I'm going to go backwards. And that's it's really similar to like what Zizek does with uh, communism, where he's like, I don't know where to go forward, so I'm just going to go back into like when we only had one type of cigarettes and we waited in line for them, and those were the good old days. And to me, I don't, like, I've never been able to make myself do that. Like, I would love to just be like, okay, I'm a primitive Baptist now, and I shake snakes at people, and that's my deal. I'm going to go, like, protest a funeral or whatever. Not that I would love to do that, but, like, I'd love to have, like, that level of enthusiasm for something like that, you know, to where you're, like, against all societal norms, this thing is my jam. But I just don't, you know, and that, I think, is the, like, more of, like, the disease of nihilism at route is, like, you can't be made happy. Yeah. And I wonder if the middle class is on the wane, but creature comforts are on the rise while so much of the population of the world is destitute. Mm-hmm. The actual 
percentage of people who are of who are above just outright suffering is on the rise. And I wonder if that is connected to this rise of what we're sort of framing as nihilism, not traditional philosophical nihilism, but I would definitely put voting for Trump and suicide bombers and being knee deep in Antifa all being forms of nihilism. And I just wonder if it's just people have too much time on their hands. Yeah. And well, with, without anything to genuinely fill it. Well, I don't know that they, well, so the thing to fill it, I think all those things are things to fill the space created by sure. nihilism, right? You know, like for, yeah. for example, like a, like far left. Sorry, nothing better to fill it with. Like yeah. To me, uh, to me, like a lot of this stuff is like basically like soccer hooliganism, right? Like you have mm-hmm. nothing to do on yeah. Sundays, you go down to the pub, you get ripped with your friends and start fighting. Like that's why, like I have a friend of mine that I go round and round about like where I'm convinced that this whole like Antifa Proud Boys thing only exists because America doesn't have soccer. Like so if sure. we had soccer hooligans and if people could fight it out, we would have no political violence at all. I, I think it's just something that people do and it's a, it's a way for people to have meeting and the media pushes those stories so much in such a seductive way that you're like, oh, I'm going to join this team or I'm going to join that team. And that, now you have something to do. Like, like oh, I'm going to be a Bears fan now. Like, boom, you're, you're I just a remember fan. a long time ago, I was um, David Jay, the bass player from Bauhaus. Um, mm. He and I were hanging out and... and no big deal. Fo- Shut up. <laughs> uh, f- uh, football came up and, and football hooliganism came up and I said something really disparaging, just, you know, fuck those guys. And he looked at me like I was completely crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, and I was like, "What? wait, whoa, what did I just say? And he's like, if there wasn't football hooligans, you have no idea what that country would have been like at the time. Yeah. Like lads getting drunk and fighting in the street and starting riots in stadiums like saved that country mm. from worse. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't doubt it. I mean, because it's like it, at least you have something to do. And it's like, you know, idle hands are devil's hands, right? And I think like one of the things that is damaging about, you know, nihilism in society is that it's created a lot of dead time for people, you know? And you're like, there's, like life is pretty easy for a lot of people, you know, like my job is challenging as it is sometimes is like, it's pretty cushy. I don't go home completely worn out. Like if I was like digging up coal all day, you know, or I, I just get home, have a pint, pass out. So you have this extra time to be sort of anxious about things. And the communists were always like, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses. Well, opiate's fucking awesome. You know, like, why would you take it away from people, you know? <laughs> and I, I think without meaning, you, you don't have the salve for your, your anxieties and hatreds and whatnot. Yeah. And you get stir crazy. Sure. I want to back up for a second because we were talking about the sort of like canon of nihilist philosophers mm-hmm. and, and them being, for the most part, white men, white European men. And Americans. Um, but I think that one thing I will say in the defense of that, I guess I would say, mm. is that the canon of philosophers in general tends to be pretty much white men. So regardless of what avenue we want to speak of a, a group of philosophers, they're going to be a bunch of white men. Do you know what I mean? It's like it, it, I think the the set is selected by philosopher, not by nihilist philosopher, mm-hmm. to engage in nihilism from a Western philosophical angle. Is to already be a part of an incredibly masculinist European lineage. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's not about nihilism being for white men with too much time on their hands. It's that philosophy has traditionally been the domain of those types of people, of us types of people. And so when we look at the canon of Western philosophy, that's who you mostly get. And so it doesn't matter if you're talking about existentialism or romanticism or phenomenology. Well, so do you think that other cultures, non-white, not, not necessarily male, do you think that they wouldn't have ended up at like a nihilist position? Because all it really takes to get to nihilism is have somebody who's really savvy going, what you're into 
is not real or not valid. And it like kind of fractures what you're into. Like, like the, Nietzsche said, like the problem with Christianity wasn't that it was okay. It was that it was so compelling that people got really, really, really close to it and were able to see all the flaws and like kind of take it apart. And you were told for so long that it, you had to believe and all this stuff. And then you got to a point where like, man, this shit isn't real. So nothing is real. And I, that could have easily happened in other cultures. I mean, you imagine with less severe restrictions for leaving, like you could, I, the same thing could probably happen in Islam, for example. Sure. You know, like e easily, like once you start investigating really tightly the miracles of any religion, they're going to fall apart from a rationalist per perspective. Sure. Well, the only uh, counterexample I kind of have at my fingertips would be what I know only through Eugene Thacker, was, which is the Kyoto School of Zen Buddhism, mm -hmm. which was uh, Schopenhauer read a lot of Eastern philosophy and then uh, a group of Buddhist philosophers who came to be known as the Kyoto School were all writing nihilist Zen Buddhist philosophy because they'd read a bunch of Schopenhauer yeah, and, which and is, Kant and Hegel. And he but, had read a bunch of Indian yes, stuff, you know, yeah. like actually uh, Nietzsche called him the Western Buddhist. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, you can get there through various routes. I think it's just that it's easy when you just sort of say nihilism. Mm. I feel like there are two things you're saying. One is just a sort of glib meaninglessness and the other is the canon of Western philosophers who wrote about this. Yeah. And again, any canon of Western philosophers until you get to a certain year in history are almost entirely white men. Yeah. It's weird. That, like, I, yeah. And there's a, there's a gang of historical reasons why that like, we don't need to go over here, you know, I like think who, they're pretty obvious. Yeah. They're, they're super obvious, but you know, they all run into, I, I think the the event that was the accelerant for like widespread nihilism was World War II and yep. specifically the Holocaust. So yep. all cultures on earth are affected by that moment. And that's where people are like, I can't understand the purpose of poetry after the Holocaust. Like that was like some, I can't remember who said that, but somebody said that. And the whole thing was like, okay, we have been shown that if there was ever a moment when there should have been a divine intervention on the planet, it would have been that. And although like, who knows, things can always get worse, you know, like you could have fucking Chernobyl half the planet probably. But I think a lot of cultures had to bear with that like tragedy or, or you know, or even uh, within it, uh, what comes after World War II is fascism basically falls apart at that point, pops up every once in a while in places. Communism kind of falls apart after that. So like people try to instate these state religions post the death of God and they all kind of don't work out e well either. So you're at this point where like, man, what the fuck are we all going to do? And, and I think that moves you into like the mode, like self-help is very individualist. You know, it moves you into this sort of like post Ayn Rand, like I'm going to get mine but even if I try to do it well and happily, I'm going to get mine. Like you don't really see like prescriptive mass self-help outside of like religions or something like that. True. Yeah. Separate from all this, I'm, I'm curious to see where this subject ends up taking our dynamic because mm -hmm. we're so opposed on so many things politically, mm -hmm. but we don't really argue, mm -hmm. which... I don't know if we ever made that a rule, but somehow we've managed to get this far with like never agreeing on anything, but never arguing with each other. Yeah. Unless we're just sort of like mocking the other lightly right. and moving on. Mm -hmm. But, um, like our text messages would get us both eliminated oh from society. Yeah. <laughs> God, that, thank God it's private for now. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, us sort of like jousting about stranger things, the stakes are pretty low. Yeah. Whereas if we're going to start talking about like violence straight up, like just lay into the subject of violence, mm -hmm. let's say different, the difference of opinion on things is going to be, uh, more pressing. Mm -hmm. It's going to, it's, you know, the stakes are slightly higher for both of us when we're right. talking specifically about something where we're trying to derive meaning versus some pop cultural artifact. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I can't imagine myself being so sure of something that I would try to impress it upon another person. Sure. You know, that's kind of like the William Burroughs Code of the Johnson thing. It's like, mind your own fucking business. Like, yeah. even if I had figured out something 
like the the worst I would be was like if I got really fucking into CrossFit and like was like, oh, you got to go to CrossFit. I mean, I did it with jujitsu. You know what I mean? I was like, you got to go to jujitsu. You got to go to jujitsu. That's probably about as like pressing <laughs> as I get on things. Yeah. Or if I, even if I thought you were fucking up, you would have to fuck up really bad for me to make an intervention. Like the only times I've ever really intervened in other adult male friends is when it has gotten very bad. Are you saying that you tell women what to do all the time? No, I, I just wouldn't tell women what to do, period. Like, okay. it's just not my deal. Like, I would only, like, I wouldn't go up, I probably wouldn't tell, like, a girlfriend of mine, like, oh, don't date that guy. Oh, well, no, that's not true. I, I <laughs> well, certainly have. Should. Yeah, I, I have. <laughs> but, like, I think the only examples, I don't mean, like, I would never, but, like, I, the only examples I can think of is telling my friends, like, hey, man, bro, you should stop doing all those whippets. You know, that's pretty much, right. like, the only, like, and it's only really, like, AA contexts kind of, you know, mm-hmm. like an intervention level shit. Other than that, like, you know, go do you, you know? Yeah. And every time anybody's ever asked me advice and stuff, they never fucking follow it. So I never feel the need to volunteer what to do to anyone, you yeah. know? So, yeah. I mean, this is another thing is, is we're going to be talking about self-help and this isn't a self-help podcast. We're not setting this up to give people advice, Mm -hmm. but it is the subject of this podcast. And Mm -hmm. of course, I think that even though this is not an advice podcast, it does beg the question, well, who are these guys? Why the fuck should I listen to them about any of these ideas? And thinking about that also made me sort of think about, again, like Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Sharon, Mm -hmm. like all of these nihilist philosophers who are like fucking miserable. And even, of course, they're miserable. They were, you know, pessimist nihilists. It's kind of part of the, part yeah. of the deal. But even a lot of uh, a lot of philosophers who are on the flip side of that didn't necessarily have glorious, wonderful lives. You know, didn't necessarily take their own advice into bliss. Mm-hmm. It's just an interesting thing to have a philosophy versus having a, code that you follow yeah well i don't i can't think of any i guess nietzsche is pretty prescriptive about things sometimes but you get the feeling that it's mostly to like kind of amp himself up a little bit yeah you know or he's trying to be a voice of a particular type of generation at a particular type of time and it's almost like there's a his fireworks or you almost feel like like if you took a teddy bear away from a little kid and they started crying, you would want to give them a lollipop to shut them the fuck up. Like he, it's almost like he knows that like if I take God away here, I need to give you something else to do. Otherwise it's going to be just fucking chaos. And, and that's where you get to the point of like your Eugene Thackers where they're like, actually, no, it's just all chaos. And like that dude just like, I, I is terribly boring to me. You know, like <laughs> that, that shit is just, not appealing in any way because once you hit that it, it it's like why should i even care about your book you know like you're asser- you're asserting that there's no meaning there's a world without us and all this crazy stuff well then i'm just not even gonna bother reading the rest of your books because why the fuck should i you know right but he's not he's not positing a, a logical argument where you're finding a fallacy it's just no he's asserting a, an aesthetic that gets him jobs it. you know well like, or he's writing poetry and you can be on board with the aesthetic or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at his work kind of the same way I look at, like, True Detective, which, yeah. you know, obviously the, he he influenced True Detective to a certain extent, where it's just kind of an interesting thing, the way that horror movies are interesting. It, it appeals to just who I am and how I grew up, you know, like a lonely kid that watched a lot of horror movies and had a Fangoria subscription when I was a kid. I think that this also begs a certain kind of question, the sort of like, well, who are you and I, and versus mm-hmm. like, take any philosopher or self-help writer or whatever. Yeah, you didn't answer who you were. I said I was a regular ass dude. Uh, oh, I don't a boring know. job. Well, I mean, I was, I can get back to that. Yeah. But. Not boring job, but like, you know, like it's a yeah. career, you know. Um, like anything that's not fighting sharks or being a cage <laughs> fighter or exploring wilds. I mean, that's the problem with jobs is that no one writes appealing about just going to your office and having a good day at work. You right. know, it's just not a thing. Like, no, you, you have to be like a movie star or a fucking stunt driver or some crazy well, shit like I that. I think that this is what's fueling so much of what's happening in this city is that, you know, you walk around this neighborhood and people are legit wearing Google t-shirts. Like mm-hmm. they work at Google and they are flying the flag. Mm-hmm. 
there's an amount of drinking the Kool-Aid. So, so many people in the city have tech jobs or are in the tech world and yeah. they believe in it. They're doing something they believe in, even if they're absolutely a desk jockey and a, like by anyone's estimation, a cog. I think you might be surprised at how uh, uncaring to the mission statement most people are that work in these jobs. Like I, I, I don't know anyone except for the immediate founders of particular companies mm. that are really like on fire okay. about their deal. Okay. You know, I think largely when you see people with t-shirts, it's that they give so many of them away that eventually it overwhelms your closet. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> That's, but what, what I was trying to get to earlier is that that gap between your philosophy and how you live it, I think mm -hmm. is a difficulty for everybody. How many Christians walk around and live the truth of their Christianity yeah. um, versus some sort of uh, excuse-making version of it that they use to just fucking be able to get through life without being plagued by contradictions. But I think that there's also something that happens in specialization in general where philosophers, for example, are generally academics. Mm -hmm. And so what do you expect in terms of someone living a code and a really Baroque historicized philosophy when they're also part of academia? You know, there's a price to pay there. I mean, I think that's parallel to something like uh, a career politician. Mm -hmm. Like you're a servant to the people, but if you're actually a career politician, the degree to which you're a servant to the people is almost zero. Yeah, the things that you have to do to be a servant of the people exact such a cost that it forms you into a certain kind of person. Yes, yeah. and become not that thing. Yeah. And I wonder to what degree no philosopher can be their philosophy because by virtue of being a philosopher, you it becomes so untenable to be able to sort of like reach out into the void and pull out meaning and live a world like that where you're doing that work and also living upon those principles. Yeah, I, I was thinking about like... Like how do those reconcile each other? Yeah, I was trying to think about... You had said something similar about this earlier in the week or maybe last week, and I was thinking about like codes, and this is how I ended up like looking up like prison shit online. I was thinking like, okay, well, who has... Who lives by like the strictest and most, uh, I don't mean effective, like it makes your life better, but like has an, having an effect on your life, like who lives by the strictest codes. And it's basically like people in war zones and people in prison. Mm -hmm. And it's because those situations are so full of pressure that you have to be on point so hard that you need the code probably to like lift yourself up a little bit. Like I sent you that video about that guy who's like an ex-convict just talking about prison life. Yeah. And it was in, one of the things I thought was, pretty noticeable about his whole spiel when he was talking about like the way you have to be inside like you everything has to be correct you have to you know when you walk into a new prison you have to have your papers right like you have to have what it's basically the your what you were arrested for and so the person who's in charge you show them your papers and if you don't show them your papers it's a fucking uh it's a breach of etiquette. And the reason why you're showing your papers is they want to discern immediately whether or not you have some sort of child crime. And if you do, you're fucking in for it. And if you don't, then you got to figure out, you know, which racist gang you're going to join. And then you get kind of filtered out in society like that. But the guy was talking about how extreme it was and how, you know, you had to always be ready to do violence. You could never back down from opportunities to do violence. And so you had to basically always be on all the time. And he stops for a moment. He goes, I think this is an awesome way to fucking be. And I was like, whoa, that's so nuts. Like that guy's so committed to that code, even outside of prison, that like he has like a fondness for it. And you'd ask most people in the street, like, hey, man, do you think that a belief system where you have to always be ready to fucking murder somebody with a sharpened toothbrush is good or bad. And I think most average people would be like, man, that sounds terrible. Uh, but because of that dude's situation, it's like the only way to be. So I don't like, I don't know that our modern soft society is going to generate any sort of like real hardcore code to live by at this point. Whereas like in ancient philosophy, basically peasants and royalty that's pretty much all there was like living out lives on battlefields like so you yeah. had those stronger philosophies in earlier human culture i don't know that they'll emerge now i think that might be connected to 
the rise in apocalypse narratives because it yeah. takes it takes away all of these pressures and leaves you with just survival. Yeah. Yeah, the starkest and bleakest. And you see that in these like neo tribes too, like whether it be like Antifa or, you know, CrossFit or whatever. Like it's like about this, like you're trying to like in, introduce, reintroduce a struggle so that you can have a code to deal with this reintroduced struggle. All right. Yeah. Um, anything else we want to cover before we go to, go to email? I mean, I guess like, you know, we, we went pretty deep into the weeds and I think like, yeah, we sort of spiraled. I think we came into this first episode with like, oh, we'll just talk about what we're going to talk about. And yeah. so we didn't necessarily talk about anything on this and first episode. I also feel like one of the questions I think the emails he has is like, are you going to make us read a bunch of... Uh, oh, I'll just go to the straight yeah, to that yeah, one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm just going to use people's initials instead of their real names or their pseudonyms. Yeah. <laughs> their, their, uh, their preferred pseudonyms. Yeah. So uh, J.A wrote, are you guys going to make me have to read a bunch of philosophy I don't want to, like you make me watch a bunch of movies that I do? Well, you don't have to read any of this you stuff. Know, you know, yeah, so with our horror podcast, Scary Thoughts, if we're covering a movie, it's like you got to watch the movie to know what we're talking about. But with this podcast, it's just just follow along with us. You don't need to go read anything unless it seems interesting to you. I'm happy to make recommendations. Yeah. But. And the other, other thing I would note too, like, you know, people who read a lot versus people who don't read, like, even though I read a shitload, I don't necessarily think it's the fastest or even best path to having knowledge or an ability to deal with life. And when we're talking about like all these different philosophers and stuff, I, I'd like, I spent a lot of time with this shit and I barely scratched the surface. And I feel like, you know, you listen to like our Nietzsche, for example, go listen to Daniel Coffeen talk about it and me talk about it. I sound like a fucking retard, you know, and, and it's like, I read most of his books, but I haven't read them like eight times, you know? And I think that's a, a spot where like, I'm not going to tell you to read something cause I haven't read it enough myself. Right. You know? But also I feel like there's a little bit of like, let us do the work for you. Yeah. But I would say that there's self-help books that I would highly recommend people to read that's on the other true. hand. And that's kind of one of the things that I think is interesting about the self-help versus nihilism thing is I don't think I would recommend any book about nihilism, but there's like 10 self-help books that I would say you have to fucking read if you don't want to be a loser. Give me three. Uh, number one with a bullet is Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover. It's great. Yeah, it's it's the most effective book for like most people don't know about financial shit at all. They don't know anything. Most people don't even have a budget. Like simply like understanding basic household budgeting with a partner was uh, more transformative about my life than anything I've ever done. Like it was more transformative than my experience at UC Berkeley. In in America at now, if you have control over your finances, you have enough freedom to be able to worry about other shit. And if you don't have control over your finances, it's always going to be fucking with you. And so that's number one. Totally. Uh, I, I, and I, personally, yeah. I feel like my parents are amazing. I wouldn't change a thing about how they raised me. The only complaint I have, if I could like go back 40 years and tell my parents like, hey, here's, here's something you should do with your son is I wish they had instilled a sense of finances yeah. in me. I was not taught by either school or my family how to deal with money. Yeah. Uh, the way I wish that I had. And Dave Ramsey's definitely been a pretty good, uh, good crib notes for me late in life. Yeah. Uh, number two, also a classic. I think Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people. It's a, it's weirdly dated, but it's super useful. Yeah. Somebody needs to like take it and update the examples, you know, cause the yeah. language is like, it's hard on a modern ear, you know, it's like sexist yeah. in the way that your 90 year old grandpa might be, It is, you know, not maliciously, but that's the language, you know, and it, it's off, it's off putting. That one I think is huge and a personal one for me and maybe not necessarily in, in the self-help genre, but something that was influential to me, it's fucking fight club. Like I read, <laughs> like, I know it comes up on every single episode, but one of the things about that book, the book more than the movie or in, even the movie to a certain extent was in like the, its little three act structure. It shows you what it means to reject a belief system, adopt an alien belief system, and then yeah. suffer from the result of that. You know, so like it, it really yeah. made me very aware of getting super into shit 
for the sake of avoiding older shit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. But like, you know, like in, in the movie, uh, they go from being just regular drones to being space monkeys. And it's like, oh, in a lot of ways, your life is worse now because you threw yourself into this new thing that you were super excited about. So it was like, it was very cautionary for me. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? I would say Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher and William Urie. Um, mm-hmm. It's just about, it's sort of something that parallels magic with a K and, mm-hmm. but it's just about negotiating and yeah. it's really about how do you come to a place that is mutually beneficial for, yeah. for you and others anytime you're negotiating and it's sort of using negotiating in not just a business sense. It's like every day is a negotiation and how do you get to the place where you get what you want? But for him, the place of getting what you want is actually where everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to the how to win friends spot, which is like you can end up in a better place if everyone is cool. Yes. Than if you were cool and ever someone else was fucked over. Yes. Another book that we've talked about previously is The Gift of Fear, Survival Signals That Protect mm-hmm. Us from Violence by Gavin De Becker. We brought this up on yeah. our Unsane episode. It's just about fear and violence and having a very wide-eyed, frank look at how those things serve us and don't serve us when we choose to ignore them. Mm-hmm. What else? I only just read this and it was really great, but Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. Mm -hmm. which is all about how to use language nonviolently. And again, this is about negotiation as well, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, ways of speaking with people in a way that's more effective and making a connection between how you say things and how they're received Mm -hmm. and therefore how you're actually communicating is all all in phrasing, all in how you choose your words, all in how you approach dialogue with others i think that book is super interesting yeah that's all classical rhetoric stuff too like the choice of words method of delivery getting what you want versus getting what is good for the population right yeah those would be top of the list i think yeah i probably think of others along the way yeah i mean there's so many i love the first half of marie kondo's the art of tidying up what's yeah the magic art of tidying up i think it's a great book yeah, you know, just get your shit together. I think, like, even if you don't buy into her whole weird, like, Japanese witchcraft, yeah, just cleaning up your fucking house over a weekend is a, a good thing to do. This is one of the things that, um, like, I know Jordan Peterson is a radioactive fucking person, but his advice to just clean up your goddamn room is pretty good for most people. <laughs> you know, like that's that's one of the things that's kind of like to me really funny about his popularity is. He's not like, he's just repackaging. Everyone's like, oh, he's repackaging weird Christian mysticism. Man, he's repackaging like 70s area Jungian psychology, yeah. which was super popular for a while. And, and it, it's, you know, and the whole point of that is you're kind of making yourself a hero of your own story. And he has certainly made himself a hero of his story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay. Uh, another email from FL. It was a long email, but. I'll just take the the final question. Um, are either or both of you guys nihilists? Really? No. Yeah, I would say probably not. Although, like, I would say that my tendencies are far more misanthropic than yours. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think I have a much bleaker outlook on humans than you do. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, not for lack of trying, though. I try. Yeah. I try to be realistic, but I'm not. Yeah. But did I tell you that? God, this was like a month ago. I was at work and twice in the same shift, two different women with no connection to either one of them said, are you a nihilist? Well, you physically look like the nihilist from Big Lebowski more <laughs> often than not. But it was so weird. Like, <laughs> like the first time I was asked, I was like, that's a weird question for a complete stranger to ask me. But then it happened a few hours later by someone else. Yeah. So there's like serendipitous moments and there's odd coincidences and things like that. I mean, one of them looked at my tattoo and was like, we studied that book in college. Oh, you really? Know? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. So that one I understood. The other was just very perplexing to me. Oh, that must have been an awful professor to assign that book. I'm so jealous of her. <laughs> Although they watched True Detective too, so I don't know what the agenda of the teacher was. Yeah. Probably just to look cool in front of a bunch of undergrads. I don't know. 
honorable mention for self-help books is yeah. The Artist Way, which I'm currently redoing again. Julia like, Cameron, so good. Yeah, yeah. If you have any creative inclinations, and that doesn't mean if you're an artist, I mean just if you have any desire to sit down and just manifest ideas. Yeah. She's got great ideas on how to well, systematize it, inspire it. Yeah. Yeah. So what have we learned? Uh, we've learned nothing, which is okay. Perfect. Yeah. It's <laughs> a great place to start. Yeah. Well, where do you want to end up? You know, like this is kind of like a sprawling, aimless episode that I feel is successful and unsuccessful in ways. Where do I want to end up with this episode or where do I want to end up with this podcast? Uh, episode and podcast. Episode, I don't know. I think there's no way to end it because I think we didn't have a very specific agenda with episode one. Mm-hmm. With this podcast, I don't know. I mean, for me, I've always been a sort of seeker with no destination mm-hmm. in mind. And I think that that's why this non-journey is very appealing to me is, you know, it's like utopia. It's like you're never going to reach it, but you should also always be striving for it. Yeah. And I feel like that's the search for meaning as well. It's really... um condescending to speak for everybody like that to say that there is no meaning and you can only make it you can only invent it Mm because the majority of humanity actually has meaning that they did not create that they did not generate yeah uh, from scratch they inherit or discover along the way and Um, a lot of the meaning people create for themselves is pretty fucked up i mean that's basically mm -hmm. the plot of taxi driver Mm -hmm. right yeah sure but I think, you know, for me, it's, it's all about process. It's all about the journey. And, yeah. Uh, you know, digging into these very different ways of approaching things, whether we're going to talk about new age music or the secret or operation werewolf, you know, I think it's all really fascinating ways of approaching. Like, again, I think I said this last episode of scary thoughts, like you're going to be dead soon. So might as well figure out something interesting to do while you're waiting. Yeah. To me, this feels like we've been accepted to a PhD program, but haven't chosen a thesis yet. That's fair. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm so excited to start here. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> There's a work ahead. That, I think that's a really astute framing of what we're doing right now. Yeah. And then I guess to also add, it's not like we're giving up on scary thoughts and horror movies. No. Proper. No. Yeah. Yeah even though the next episode is not a horror movie, but a sci-fi action movie. I would say it's as much of a horror movie as Alien is. You know, the Predator Fair. is functionally like Mike Myers. All right. You know, he's, like, he's, he's chasing down a gang of kids, right? but they happen to be special Sorcerers, forces guys. Yeah. You know, it's pretty much the same thing. All right. Well, I'm excited to watch it for the first time. It's so good, man. You're going to be so stoked. Arnold Schwarzenegger is maybe... The greatest American from Austria. (laughs) All right. Is that it? That's it. All right. So we'll see you next time on Scary Thoughts for Predator. Although if you're listening to just self-help for nihilists, we'll see you next time for, I don't know, we're going to talk about it, figure out what's next. Episode dose. Yeah. And um, you can email us at what the at scarythoughts.org or nihilists at scarythoughts.org. Thanks for listening. Later. The people have spoken. Fuck. Eh. No. <coughs> oh, Jesus. <clears throat> what happened to you just then? I think I had a pepper or something in my tooth.